I, I understand there are a lot of people here not from the United States, so I didn't mean to insult you with this slide. This is the, uh, this is the kind of mantra that Bill Clinton ran on in 1992 when he defeated George Bush the first, and it was, it's the economy, stupid. That is, you got to keep your eye on the economy. And I do want to talk a little bit about economics. I, I, I won't tr talk too much dollars and cents, but I, I think we need to start with this slide. And this says, oil companies do not produce oil. Oil companies produce profit by producing oil when and where conditions permit. And that is how oil companies behave. And that's how you have to understand and interpret all the supply data, all the demand data, and alike. So I'm going to try and work a little bit of economics into, the, into my talk today. And this is what I'd like to talk to you about today. There, if you, you can go to sleep after I read you this summary, and if you wake up and you've missed the whole talk, this is what I want you to remember. And that is, there are large uncertainties about the amount of oil that remains to be produced but it really doesn't matter. No matter what, no matter how much oil remains in the ground to be produced, the peak in global oil production is going to occur within a kind of 20-year window, and there's really not much wiggle room about that. Point number two, after oil production peaks, large quantities of alternative oil are going to be needed in a very short amount. The point being that we will need the equivalent of a Saudi Arabia of alternative fuels within a, about a decade of that peak. And I'll leave it to you to pick what your favorite alternative is. Uncertainty about the peak generates a divergence in what works best for private firms and society as a whole, such that there's good reason to believe that the competitive market is not going to generate alternative fuels when the market needs them. So we can't leave this to a competitive market to solve the problem completely. So let me get right to my point, and uh, I, I will say, I don't know if Charlie Hall's in the office, but my introduction to energy was in an undergraduate class at Cornell University where I actually got to meet M. King Hubbard. I never worked with him. I am, I'm a, I am a young man, but I, I did get to meet him, and he was a pretty impressive guy. So, so here's Hubbard's uh, forecast, and it, it is remarkable. The green dots are the data that Hubbard had available to him when he made his forecast. The yellow line is Hubbard's forecast, and the red dots are what we've seen since Hubbard's forecast. And he did get the actual shape, or the actual peak, pretty much correct, but having been trained in economic statistics, there is a problem with this prediction, and that is there are long periods when Hubbard's model underpredicts production. There are other periods when the model underpredicts production. And to a statistician, this smacks of what's known as a spurious regression. That is, the model is not really capturing what's driving the system. In order to do that, I wrote a paper where we actually use some fairly sophisticated econometric techniques. I won't bore you with what they are, but I will tell you that Clive Granger won a Nobel Prize in economics for that. And uh, what the model says, it's a pretty simple model. It says that oil production in the lower 48 states depends upon the real wellhead price of oil, as you would expect as oil prices get higher. Mo oil companies are willing to produce more oil. The cost of producing oil, how much it actually costs to extract oil out of the ground. And again, nothing shocking here. As the cost of pulling oil out of the ground rises, you tend to produce less of it. And then this ration variable, which was the fraction of oil that the Texas Railroad Commission allowed to operate. And for those of you not familiar with kind of US politics and the Texas Railroad Commission, there was a period during the 1960s where if you owned a well in Texas, you could only produce it at about 30%. 70% of your operable capacity was shut in. And it turns out this statistical model does a really good job of forecasting the rate of production. I, I don't want to build myself up, but it did a little better job than Hubbard's model, but on the other hand, it had the, the luxury of hindsight. And it does indicate two things. The first thing was that Hubbard was a genius. 
And that is, it turns out, no, regardless of your estimate for how much oil is in the ground, the peak doesn't change very much. So Hubbard could have been wrong about how much oil was in the ground, and the peak wouldn't have changed very much. That is the date of the peak. However, he was very lucky. That is, had prices evolved over a different path, or had the Texas Railroad Commission opened up and shut in production in a different manner. And so if we go back here, this very rapid rise to a peak in here was due to the Texas Railroad Commissioning, Commission excuse me, opening up production. So had the Texas Railroad Commission behaved in a different manner, had prices been different, Hubbard would have been a lot less accurate. So what can we take away from that? The important point here is, why doesn't Hubbard's model work very well for global data? So what I have here are, this is actual world production of just crude oil and condensates. It does not include natural gas liquids, which is a separate population. And here's Hubbard's curve for global oil production. You notice a peak that's about now, and that's why we've heard here and in other publications that a peak in oil production is imminent. And you notice that it doesn't do a very good job right here. And there are a couple of problems with it. The first problem is that the integral of the curve is really off. So that if you look at how much oil Hubbard's curve predicts to be produced between 1900 and 2004, it predicts about 1.2 trillion barrels of oil to be produced. And if you look in reality, only about a trillion barrels of oil have been produced. It's about 20% off, not a small number. The other problem is, we, is this problem right here. What is going on here? And what's going on here is, contrary to what we heard about yesterday, there is demand destruction. And during that period, production was not limited by supply. It was limited by demand. Just to give you an idea, oil demand grew by 36 million barrels per day between 1960 and 1973. It increased by only 17 million barrels per day in the 25 years between 1973 and 1998. Let's look back here. There's actually a 10-year period in here in which demand declined relative to the prior peak. Between 1979 and 1989, demand was actually lower than it was before. This is despite a 30% increase in world GDP. So when people tell you there's no such thing as a price response or demand destruction, they're ignoring significant parts of the historical record. What's more important is if you try and fit Hubbard's curve to these data, Hubbard's curve mistakes this period as a supply constraint. There's absolutely no evidence that this is a supply constraint. This is an all-time high in oil prices, 1979, and only after 1986 when we get a collapse in prices does oil demand actually pick up again. So one of the dangers of fitting a Hubbard curve and, and including these data in the sample is Hubbard curve, Hubbard's curve thinks this is resource depletion. This is demand destruction. Let me illustrate. Not only is that demand destruction, but that period of high prices turned oil production on its head. In that, think about it. Had we gone along merrily as we were doing before 1973, where would the oil have come from that we produced between 1973 and now? Odds are it would have come from OPEC countries, which are the low-cost producers. What I have here is a graph that shows the change in world oil supply and demand relative to 1973, and there are three colored bars up here. The yellow is non-OPEC production, the red bars are OPEC production, and these purple bars are world oil demand. So again, you see this demand destruction relative to even 1973. So by 1983, we were below 1973 levels of demand. But what's critical is these bars here. Between 1973 and now, OPEC has literally reduced its production. Instead, most of our oil came from 
significant increases of between 10 and 20 million barrels per day of non-OPEC production. What is most of this oil? Much of this oil is the North Sea. It's offshore Mexico. This is not cheap oil. Producing oil in the North Sea is expensive. This is oil that should have been produced at the tail of Hubbard's curve, right? We should have started with the cheapest sources. And as we depleted Saudi Arabia, as we depleted the Persian Gulf, that's when we should have gone to the North Sea. So literally, we've produced oil backwards and we've had significant demand destruction. So I would argue that you can't apply Hubbard's curve blindly to the data. So what do I have here? I have two curves, and I'm sorry they're not showing up as well. If you take Hubbard's curve and you fit it to the entire sample, 1900 to 2004, you get a curve that looks like this, that has a Q infinity, a total recoverable supply of about 1.8 to 2 trillion barrels of oil. If I exclude this period, I get a much taller curve. I get a curve that now peaks in 2006, but has a Q infinity of 4 trillion barrels. So if indeed this is demand destruction and not limits on production on the supply side, you get a very different result from Hubbard's methodology. But let me go back now to the genius of Hubbard's insight. Hubbard's insight was that we're not going to production is not going to go up and up and up over time, and then it's going to fall off the table. But there will be some kind of production curve where production rises to, as Hubbard says, one or more peaks, and then fall off. So let's take Hubbard at, its word, at his word and kind of play with that uncertainty and see what it means. So what I had one of my students do, we went through the literature and we tried to find estimates for how much oil was remaining in the ground, and the low estimates are about 0.8 trillion barrels. A high estimate that's semi-respectable, it was produced by the US Geological Survey. The upper 5% bound is there's another 2.9 trillion barrels left in the ground. So literally a four-fold difference in estimates as, as to how much oil's in the ground. Now the other constraint on Hubbard's curve was it was symmetric production rose and fall on the same path. But there's no reason for that to be true. You can envision a case where higher prices after the peak slows, to, slows the fall off in production. Or you can imagine a world just the opposite, in which once you deplete those big fields, production falls off very rapidly. So let's look at different production paths where we have fast growth and fast declines, slow growth and slow declines, or any combination therein. So let's first look at the effect of uncertainty on about how much oil remains on the date of the peak. So again, here are the dates, here's million barrels of oil per day, and here's historical production. So if we assume that there are 0.8 trillion barrels left to be found and produced, we get, excuse me, we get something that looks like this, a curve that rises a little bit more and has a peak in 2013. If we assume that there are 1.5 trillion barrels left, now we change the peak to 2022. We assume that there's 1.5 trillion barrels excuse me, 2.5 trillion, 2 trillion barrels left. We have a peak at 2027. And if we take the upper, upper limit on this, anybody have a guess where this is going to be at 2.9 trillion barrels? It's going to be at 2036. So you can take a fourfold increase in the estimate for how much oil remains, and you don't really move the peak all that much. How about the shape of the production path? So now we're going to take kind of a middle estimate. I do not mean to imply that this is the best estimate. It's just a number, 1.5 trillion barrels left to produce. And we're going to see what different shapes for the production path imply. So maybe we're going to have, we'll go back to a very cheap oil world where we have rapid increases in production, rapid decreases in production. <coughs> 
production peaks in 2024. Maybe we'll have a very slow world, slow increase in demand, slow decline in production. If that's the case, the peak is in 2036. What if we have a fast increase in production and then a slow drop off? The peak is in 2018. What if we have a fast, uh, excuse me, a slow rise in demand and a fast drop off? Then it's 2038. So again, if you take 1.5 trillion barrels left to produce and you slice it all different kinds of ways, again, you can't move the peak very much. And if you have double peaks, you, that doesn't help either. It moves, the fir, it moves the big peak forward. So what I want you to take away from this first part is no matter how you slice the data, how much oil's left, what path we're going to produce it on, it's not going to peak tomorrow, but you can narrow that peak to a 20-year window. And to some degree, that's all you need to know. The other point I want to try and make is we're going to need alternatives very quickly after the peak. So as a simple exercise, if we take this graph and literally subtract production on the far side of the peak from the peak value and assume that there's no net increase in the demand for liquid fuels, we can figure out how quickly we need alternative fuels. And what I have here is the price path. So this is the year of the peak. This is years after the peak. This is million barrels per day in needed alternatives. And you can see that within a decade, you need 10 million barrels per day of alternatives. 10 million barrels per day is about the current rate of production by Saudi Arabia. And you can see once we go beyond that, it ramps up even faster. So we need a new Saudi Arabia in alternatives within 10 years of a peak. And the critical point is, is the market going to deliver that in a timely fashion? Well, why would the market do that? Why would a market generate an alternative source of energy to supply to the market after the peak? We're going to talk about that next. Roger's going to talk about the alternatives that are available, but I want to focus on what are the economic incentives that are going to generate that. And there are, two, there are two things that may generate it. One is higher prices. If you're a firm that anticipates higher prices, you will invest now to make sure alternatives are available in the future. Or if you anticipate a peak in production, there will be a demand for your fuel. And again, you will invest ahead of that peak to make the supply available. Well, unlike the hoteling model, which I also have some problems with, and the hoteling model, for those of you not familiar, that's the standard economic model of resource depletion, the cost of extraction does not rise smoothly towards the peak. So what I have here are data for oil production in the lower 48 states, and now I'm in billions of barrels per year. And this red line is the extraction cost of oil in the lower 48 states. And what you can see is, despite a huge or a, a doubling and tripling in production during this period, there's really no net increase in the cost of extracting oil. After the peak, there's this huge increase in the cost of extracting oil. But if you're hoping that a steady rise in the extraction costs of oil are going to incentivize producers of alternative to generate those incent uh, to generate the investment needed to provide the alternatives in a timely fashion, that's probably not going to happen. So let's go back to this idea of a peak. If oil production is going to peak, and I believe it does, and I th think most people in the room would agree, then the question is, Will firms generate that investment if they think about the peak? Well, the problem is the peak is uncertain. I've just demonstrated it's uncertain. There are, I know there are people in this room who disagree, me, disagree with me about the timing of the peak, but the timing is uncertain. And that uncertainty creates problems. And the problems can be explained as follows. If you're a firm and you're investing a lot of money to produce an alternative, do you want to be a little bit late or do you want to be a little bit early? 
If you're a little bit early, there's still crude oil left, and there's not much demand for your product, and so your return on investment really suffers. If you're a little bit late after the peak, there's demand for your product, you're okay, and so if you're a risk inverse investor, which most investors are to some degree, you'll plan to be a little after the peak. On the other hand, if you look what's best for society, just the opposite is true. We've built up this huge infrastructure that runs on oil. What are the consequences if firms are a little early in their investments? If they're a little early, it means really nothing. You still have crude oil and you have these alternatives available if you need them. But if firms are late with their production of alternatives, your huge capital stock sits there and you have to idle a significant fraction of it because you literally don't have the supply to run it. So if your society as a whole, you want firms to be early in their investment decisions. If you're an individual investor, if you're in a firm, your best bet is to be late. And there is, a, what, that's what's known in the market or in economics as an information externality, and the market will not solve that problem on its own. The final point I want to try and make is, are we even going to get to a peak? Does economics matter? in that we may have the geology, we may have the oil in the ground, but is OPEC going to be willing to produce the oil that the consuming nations want? So up until very recently, the Department of Energy, when it figured out how much oil OPEC was going to produce, it took oil prices as an exogenous variable. It figured out what demand would be at that price. It figured out how much oil would be produced by non-OPEC countries because their in general behavior is like a competitive firm. And they simply assumed that oil production by OPEC would fill that gap. And it turned out when you ran that model, they needed about 40 million barrels per day pretty soon from OPEC to fill that gap. And when they approached the Saudi oil minister and they told him about the DOE forecast, he said, well, that's a pretty neat forecast, but Saudi Arabia had no plans to ramp up production anywhere near that fast. Why not? What I have here are the results of a model I built with uh, members of the European Central Bank. They're the bank that manages the euro. They're very concerned about inflation, as you might expect. And so we ran a little scenario in which we said, what if OPEC decides to increase its productive capacity? Well, if OPEC decides to increase its productive capacity, what you have is some overhang in the market. Now there's spare capacity, and oil prices come down some. Oil prices come down, the demand for oil picks up, economic activity accelerates, and the demand for oil picks up. But for an economist, the question is, what is the balance of those two changes? What I have here in yellow is the change in OPEC production, that's read off this axis, yellow axis, where the numbers here are 0%, and this is a 3% change in OPEC production. The change in price is here in red, and it's read off of this axis, and this percentage here, this is negative 10%. The point is, this negative 10% change in price trumps this positive 3% change in production. In other words, OPEC revenues suffer if they expand capacity to facilitate demand. So if you're a Saudi oil minister or from Venezuela, there's no economic incentive for you to really ramp up production. So just in case you were asleep while I was talking, this is what I want you to remember. No matter how much oil remains, it doesn't really move the peak very much. A new Saudi Arabia is needed within a decade of the peak. A competitive market is not going to deliver alternative fuels in a timely fashion. And OPEC is not likely to increase production to generate that nice peak. And as you hear, my time is up. Thank you.